Welcome to the Reschooled Podcast, the show that discusses all the things that schools may have missed with your hosts, AJ Kuti and Jason Gordon. Hey everybody, welcome back. We are the Reschooled Podcast, the show that discusses the things that schools may not have prepared for. As always, I'm AJ sitting across from me. Jason, Jason, how are you doing today? Doing great, AJ. Happy, uh, happy to make it to the end of the semester. Nope. Well, yeah, no kidding. It is the end of the semester for my teaching side, but I'm still going through school. I still have two exams to go. Yeah, I feel sorry so, for you, man. <laughs> I am just, I'm, 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 I'm ready for this semester to be over. It's, it's been a good semester, uh, and I, like I said, I've been utilizing the stuff that we've actually been talking about, especially in the notes side, uh, taking notes. That was something that was never really big for me, mm-hmm. and um, I've tried to, I've tried to kind of bridge that gap of what we talked about where you it's not all typing you want to write your notes out mm-hmm. but I, I'm also very technical like I love the technology side of it and so I write all my notes out on my iPad oh okay and uh, and I'm able to to do things which is really nice for me one of the tests uh, allows us to use notes on the exam and so uh, in my notes cuz our our exams have like five or six chapters within them Mm-hmm. One of the apps that I use for my, my writing my notes allows me to search and it searches my handwritten notes. So if I want to, so if I want to just put some keywords, it'll take me right to those, that page, even though they're handwritten, not necessarily typed out. So that's really, that's helped me a ton. Oh, absolutely. I mean, using your technology resources, my problem is I, I tend to just put things down, you know, type them, write them, whatever. And then ultimately I don't go back to them, right? Yeah. I just moving things around <laughs> like, you know, uh, Paper handwritten bullet point has always been the only thing that makes things stick for me. Of course, I've you know, done a lot, a lot more bullet everybody's points. Everybody's got their too. thing. Yeah, I've done a lot more bullet points with my notes in this one. Um, I've done the whole, you know, start one way and then indent, indent kind of subcategories and stuff like that, which has helped me a ton. But even going like going back to what we I've talked about from the very beginning of our, our podcast when it started was, you know, the strategy side of it. And even now I'm seeing myself still with that strategy mentality of you know, this class I take notes this way, this class I take notes completely differently, this this class I don't take notes at all because it's for a different, you know, there's a different level or a different layer of, of, of learning in that class. And so there's still a ton of strategy within this. And I, I hopefully the listeners are, are kind of grabbing onto that as we talk about these through these episodes. But it has really, it does really help me. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and I will also a, say too, have, I mean, the my even going back to the episode about... um we were doing cover letters and resumes. My wife just uh, applied for a job. Uh, hopefully by the time you listen to this, she will have got it. <laughs> but she got an interview because she changed up her cover letter. She's always had this one standard cover letter, and I let her listen to the episode of cover letters. And she completely reformatted her cover letter and hit some – when she read it to me, I was like, did you really write that? Like it was really good. Oh, wow. And uh, she took – and she got a call back, and she's she's going in for the interview soon. So hopefully – Success? Have, yeah, no Maybe. kidding. That's awesome. It makes you feel good, doesn't it? Oh, it does. But let me ask you this. Do you have any more empathy for your students since you're working so hard and, you know, teaching at the same time type scenario? Or or are you just, oh, I'm doing this. You know, you should be working harder to no, which way to go on that one. It's it's interesting you say that because there's part of me that goes, well, this is quite a quite a bit of work. Um, and, and especially in the, the, the program that we're in, because a lot of it is is online. We're doing it kind of on our own time, uh, although there are due dates. Um, th- it reinforces the importance of actually learning it for the purpose of learning, not for the purpose of grades. Mm-hmm. I think that is the biggest thing that has has hit me harder than anything else is, you know, going through undergrad, going through the master's program, and I see in a lot of my students that I teach is the focus is solely the grade. And in this program, and even the professors, the, my professors are telling me that it, the grade's not important. It's just the fact that you're getting something out of this class. You're getting through this class, learning something. Mm-hmm. And how you go about doing that is different for each person. So, you know, some people rely on the face-to-face interaction. Some people can do it reading on a book. And it is the professors, more or less, it's the responsibility to find a way to encompass everyone's needs within the class. So some people, you're going to have to do things that you may not jive well with, but you're also going to do things that may work for you and what works for you may work, that may not work for somebody else. And so they're going to do something different there. So there's different modalities that needs to be included in these classes. And I'm starting to learn that more and more. And, Mm -hmm. but again, it just reemphasizes the fact that it is more about learning and the the learning aspect of it is going to take more work. If you're simply Mm -hmm. just trying to, to memorize and get out of the class, you're, you're wasting your money. 
Um, right. And that was that's a big thing that I got out of it. Well, those are all great points. Before we go any further, though, and before we lose anybody, yeah, attention, yeah, no got to remind everybody we got to uh, you got to visit our website. You got to check out our re- most recent episodes. Check out our old episodes too if you have if you've missed any of them. Again, these are evergreen; they stay alive forever and are always going to be relevant. Hopefully, <laughs> right? Uh, but that being said, right, reschool dot com. Also, the social media handles reschooled pod on Instagram, LinkedIn, all those good things. But then. Uh, 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 your favorite podcasting platform. We need your review. We need you to give us those five stars so we, once again, start, you know, r- rising in popularity. So if you like us, let us know about it in that way. And then lastly, send us send us your questions, right? Keep those questions coming in so know, we know exactly what you want to hear about. That's right. And so for this episode, we are going to get into the sixth chapter of our general career series, and we're going to continue talking about LinkedIn. So this is kind of like the part two section of LinkedIn. Last episode, if you want to go back and listen to that, it's kind of more the introduction of LinkedIn, what it does, why it's important, those kind of things. But this one, we're going to talk about really how to get the most out of your LinkedIn page. Mm -hmm. Uh, As we talked about last uh, episode, there's a lot that you can get from it professionally. And so we want to kind of set you up to where you can get the most out of it. Uh, So that sound good to you? Absolutely. Like I say, giving people tools to use and that's what this one's about. So, Well, as, as if you can remember what I said last episode, uh, LinkedIn, it was never a big part of mine. I'm still learning it. And so this is probably going to be me more of just asking you questions. I'm interviewing you. Um, I'm still trying to get mine set up. So hopefully by the time this drops, I will have a very nice one. Um, Well, this is one of those things, one of those areas that I do know a lot about. So I am happy to talk about it. (laughs) Well, let's get into the quick question first. Uh, And I'm sure because LinkedIn is something that not only do you use pretty regularly in your personal life, but you also teach about this in your classes. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of LinkedIn profiles. What's the coolest thing you've ever seen on a LinkedIn profile? I've seen people use it to absolute perfection, really just one or two people. And when I say that, there's going to be different purposes for which you use LinkedIn, right? It can be the whole finding an opportunity. It could be uh, getting uh, found. It could be just raising your personal profile out there in the world, that type of thing. A lot of ways to use it. But I watched somebody who was on the project creation side. They did a lot of work and they documented the work that they did, not only in school, but professionally, right? Extremely well. Videos, uh, images, proof of work, analyses, uh, planning documents, things like that. Things that, you know, they were willing to put out there to the world. They documented their proof of work through projects marvelously. Wow. And seeing that, so using all those elements in there, when you went to this person's LinkedIn profile, it was the most comprehensive, right? You can you can build your own website and you can put r- reviews from people on there. Y- you can put proof of work. You can put what you're selling, that type of thing. You can do all of that, but building yourself up on LinkedIn, right? You can get endorsements. You can get people who, again, will attest to the quality of what you do, but you can post the proof of work. It is your own little mini personal website. And seeing somebody use it to that extent was just awe inspiring, right? That it will, it had the ability, and they weren't even using it to create opportunities at the moment, but they had the ability to generate opportunities above and beyond with what they've done. And I was just impressed by it, right? It's just a record of their, uh, their professional history. I'm going to use, so normally I would answer that question, but since I don't have a whole lot of experience on LinkedIn, I don't have much of an answer. So I'm going to actually use my time that I would normally answer this to ask you a separate question, because this is really cool what you were just talking about. But what happens when you're somebody like, let's just say me, for instance, if I'm, I'm going to go look at people's LinkedIn and I'm going to start looking at it, I'm going to get really kind of, um, my ego is going to get really deflated real quick because my page does not stack up to, to most. I don't mm-hmm. have the credentials. And, and like, like you're just saying, this person who put all that stuff out there really makes themselves um, look like they're, they're exactly what they are. They're, they're doing amazing work mm-hmm. and you're using it as proof of work. How do I combat the feeling of not, what's the point? How do I feel? How, how do I combat that point of what's the point of me trying if you've got people like this who put so much out there that are so much, maybe I feel are better than me. And there's no way for me to stack up. So what's the point? How do I combat that? So get it in your mind that you're not doing it as a competition. 
It's not first place, second place. There are millions of jobs. There are millions of connections. There are millions of career opportunities just floating out there, right? So not every one person gets every one of them. Sure. You're trying to make your own way. And that person whose LinkedIn profile may look amazing has nothing to do with what you want to do in your career path in life, right? So use them not as a source of competition, but as a model, okay. right? Because LinkedIn, as much as anything, it's putting yourself out there, but it also can be a planning tool for you. It will make you think about the things that you need to do, the skills you need to develop, the uh, c connections you need to make, right? That type of thing. It's a great research tool. You can see what a career path looks like, what other people did, and you can start to mimic some of those things in your own way by saying, no, I need to go find an internship in this. No, I need to learn this skill set by going on YouTube or uh, LinkedIn learning or something like that, right? To pick up this skill set. Oh, I really would like to do this at some point in time in my life. And oh, I see how they presented their travel, right? I try, you know, uh, this is, this gives me ideas about how I can present what I've done traveling or whatever in a positive light, that type of thing. So just always think about it as nothing but a model and something that you can aspire to, right? Uh, I play tennis and I don't pretend that I'm going to compete. <laughs> with Novak Djokovic, yeah. but I can certainly certainly watch the guy play and watch his ground strokes and say, well, that does give you something to aspire to, doesn't it? Yeah, that makes sense. All right. That's a, that's a good answer to that because I've, I've always wondered that, like, there's there's people out there that that are leaps and bounds. They're, they're professionals. I mean, exactly what they are. They're, they're experts, professionals in their fields, and they have a lot of credentials backing them up. And when you don't have what you feel is a lot of credentials, you start to get a little disheartened. Um, but that makes complete sense. It's not, it's not a competition. So, yeah. Well, let's All get right. into the main topic. Okay. Uh, main topic questions we have, and like, again, we're going in kind of more in depth, uh, when it comes to your LinkedIn profile. So let's just start in the very basics. And that is what are the parts of a LinkedIn profile? Well, to start with, you're going to have your profile picture, mm -hmm. right? It needs to be professionally done. And there's tons of resources on the internet out there to show you. The biggest thing I can say is be genuine. If you're going to smile, make it a genuine smile. Think about something happy, that type of thing. Crop it around your shoulders so they can focus in on your head and face. You don't need these full body things, right? Um, so professional looking headshot. Part You can do that on your own. All you need is good lighting. It's not a big deal. Right. But just make sure, again, it, it gives off that professional appearance, the clothes you're wearing, uh, you know, your hair's done appropriately, that type of thing. Right. You've got a background or header type photo. Right. Um, type thing in the background. Think about that and think in terms of how is it going to make you look interesting. So put something interesting there. That's all when people visit your site that, you know, image has a very powerful effect in many ways, more powerful than words. So making certain that when people see you, they get an idea of what you want them to experience, right? My recommendation is professionalism, but, you know, some people are putting their personality out there in different ways, okay? Just make sure it's achieving what you're looking for, okay? Name and title. So your name is your name, but the title you have needs to be a working title, right? And I'm going to talk to you throughout about using keywords, Keywords that are related to your career field and things like that, because when people search for you on LinkedIn or people come across you on LinkedIn, you want that to speak to them, you know, what they're searching for, what they're looking for. So, again, keywords there in the title is going to be huge, but I'll talk more about that in a minute. So having that talking title, as we say, like for me, I'm a professor, but my talking title is business and legal educator. Right. Very Separation. Prestigious. Right. Education, innovation, and strategy, the areas, the more specific areas in which I like to focus or have an interest, right? So all of these are great keywords that come across. It paints me as an educator. It paints me as, you know, the field in which I work as well. So that's a talking title, right? Uh, next, you've got the About Me section. That is going to be your opportunity to, again, it's like your cover letter. It's you telling the world the things that you're going for, what you're looking for. Again, it's a great place to put in those keywords that people will be searching for so that you'll come up, right, when they search those keywords. And that's mainly what I'm going to talk to you about and how you use it getting found, right? So anyway, this about section is going to be critical. 
Then you've got your experience. That's what most people jump to immediately, right? It starts off the way your resume would. You name the company that you work for, and then you put the positions below it. And then you have this section below it where you can write about what you do in those positions. I highly recommend that you have talking sections. This is where you can post proof of work, anything from photos, videos, uh, Word documents. And like I say, you may not be able to post a Word document, but you can post a Google document and put the link in there, right? Uh, Things like that that show what you did in that job. Because more so than just what you did, you also have the opportunity to show your general competence and business acumen. And that's how you're going to use those sections under there. And once again, let's not forget, it's an opportunity to use those keywords that people are searching for if you want people who are searching to find you. Okay, type scenario. And, you know, it's um, chronological in terms of what you did, but you can move them around if necessary. But generally, this is a CV, right? It's the running total of things you've done in your life. So you put all the things down there, the things that are more important, you just make them smaller. Okay, it also allows you to link to those pages of the companies you work for. If you started your own company or did your own thing, you can create your own uh, LinkedIn page. So that, you know, once again, you're linking to that page or that project. And on that page, you can lay out the full project that you worked on. You can lay out the full business uh, that you created, whatever type scenario. So your experience section has all sorts of opportunities in there for you to, one, expand and give people more information. And once again, that's just proof of work, proof of ability, gives people ideas of what you can do for them uh, type thing. But again, the fact that it allows for video, allows for download or embedded documents, that type of thing is, is huge. Would you then say, you, it's in, well, before you go to the next one with the experience, because sure. you're talking about these keywords, mm-hmm. would you say it is important to take some time to maybe do some research to see what these, these, these um, hot words, like the ones that are most down, uh, uh, searched and stuff like that. Do you think it's important to take that time to do that rather than just using, like you said, using, instead of using teacher, you use educator or, or something along those lines. Like it's, it's important to, to be able to, to get that point across and, and to, to the searchability of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about it. And for this, it's not like the same type of word search you do for search engine optimization out there to try to make your website found. In this, you're trying to think, what are recruiters searching for? What are the people who are looking for new employees or searching for talent? What are they looking for in terms of search terms? And usually it's closely related to what they are presented in a job description. So if you know your career field, industry path, that type of thing, you can narrow that down and start pulling the keywords from it. The required characteristics, the preferred characteristics, things like that, and say, look, these are the industry-specific words. These are the titles. These are the skill sets. These are the whatever, right? Whatever keywords are in there. And narrow them down and incorporate those. Use those words in one form or another. And so if you do that background research, yeah, you you are ready to optimize your profile to be found. So excellent question, but your research is going to be 99% of the time searching through job descriptions gotcha. and seeing what information you can glean from it. Cool. So uh, great question. Next section, education, right? A lot of you are at the point of considering education, right? Right now, you've probably in high school, completed high school, started college, considering grad school, whatever, right? You're going to document your education. And that's not just the thing, places you've gotten a degree from, right? It could be uh, certification courses you've taken. It may be training sessions you've attended, things like that, right? There's a completely separate sections for licenses and certifications. So if you've actually got some kind of certification in something, you can put that in a second, in a separate section completely, okay? You can identify your particular skills and other people can endorse you for those skills, right? Again, it's just a testament. This is something that's popular on individual uh, web pages and things like that. So again, an opportunity for you to use that to the best of your ability by putting down your skill sets and having other people who in some way have experienced that to endorse you for it. You can ask people for recommendations, 
You can give recommendations through the platform. And the recommendations are amazing because, once again, they're collapsible, but they're right there on your profile. Okay, if people are seeing if, once again, you are who you claim to be, you can have people attest to that. Have them in their own words tell the world. And I do caution you on their own words. I got a tip and a trick for that about how you uh, make certain that whoever leaves you a recommendation does it in a great way, right? It's, it's kind of the same way we do recommendations uh, outside of LinkedIn. You write it for them. <laughs> okay, and you Amen. send it to them. At, at, yeah, right? <laughs> you, you write it for them, you send it to them as an example. Yep. And, you know, they can read through it and use it as, lots of times they won't change much. But if that's the case, right, they're using it as an example. They're going to use those same key elements. You can work those keywords in there again. Okay. You know, publications or published work, that type of thing, you can actually include proof of work there, language proficiency, interests, groups you follow, uh, things like that, right? Influencers you may have, companies that you follow, right? Following the right companies so that it shows up in your news feed type scenario, when they're doing things like posting new jobs or something big happens in their industry, that type of thing. Once again, that's a, a it, it speaks to what your interests are. It speaks to who you are professionally type thing. So those are the main sections that you're going to work through there. And I know I've been through a long list there, but ho- hopefully that, you know, you're starting to see that this is a collective package where whatever your objective is, you can use these together in a cohesive manner to achieve what you're looking for. Okay. So after education, it looks like you got licenses and certifications. If you have mm-hmm. any. Um, one question I had about that, and I was looking, I'm, I'm obviously looking at your page and not mine. Uh, I noticed you have your licenses and your certifications under that appropriate uh, title, but you also include certificates under your education. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I'm, this is this is probably a, an a, an episode for later. But just really quickly, what would be the de- the difference between for our listeners? What's the difference between certificates and certifications? So certificates is just something you completed, right? A certification is some uh, organism, normally some governmental agency that recognizes your legal ability to do something, mm-hmm. right? Or that agency simply recognizes you as a member of that agency, right? So that is their your certification that you receive for them to undertake these tasks, right, with their endorsement. A certificate just means you completed it, right? You went through this and you did this. So that's the difference between the two, right? A certificate does not lead to a certification. A certification oftentimes comes with a certificate to uh, substantiate it. Well, is it, is it, and I could be off my, uh, off base here, but isn't a certification something that you have to normally keep up with versus a t- certificate you you have? So like usually in accounting, if you're a certified CPA or, or you have your CPA, you have to do CPE hours. You have to have CPE hours so mm-hmm. many years or so many a year, whereas a certificate, once you get it, you got it. Right. That's a great point. Um, yeah. It's like I have my bar licenses on there and yes, I have to do continued education every year. I have to pay a annual fee to be, you know, uh, still a member, that type of thing. So yes, you have to keep up with it. It's something that doesn't, um, that, it, but the certificate on the other hand, it's just like a degree. You earned it. It's always there. It's never going anywhere, uh, type scenario. But once again, you know, they serve a different function, right? The certification is signaling to the world that you are still certified by an organization to undertake these activities. Well, the next section, and I'm just going to, I'll read through the next ones and we'll kind of go through them here and there, but you got skill or you got uh, like, yeah, skills, recommendations, publications, I guess would be more for us on the the academia side, publications, because not everybody's going to have publications, Uh, languages and interest. Now, the one that really, really interests me is skills, because Mm -hmm. that's something that, is that something that you create yourself? Absolutely. I mean, you, you're basically telling the world about yourself. So the skills that you say you have, right, to the extent you want to, you can substantiate them. But again, anything you think that is relevant for the world to know, that's your opportunity to tell them about it. So, yes. Now, there are pre-formatted ones in there that kind of prompts you that says, you know, these are things related to what you just said. Do you, are that's you what I was you wondering have, about. Yeah. Yeah. So there are prompts in there, but you can create it yourself. Absolutely. Okay. That's a pretty interesting one. I was looking through yours and it's 
it, it it's pretty detailed. Like I was not expecting it to go that in detail. Mm-hmm. And you can see on there, you know, on, on the profile, lots of people have come in, uh, usually students and things like that, endorse you or former acquaintances and things like that, clients, whatnot, will endorse you for these specific skill sets. The next one is the, the one you talked about recently was the, the recommendations. So people mm-hmm. recommend you or you recommend them for something or some kind of, I would assume some kind of uh, skill or some kind of job that you've done mm-hmm. uh, that you've helped this person with. Right. Uh, that again, you can request uh, recommendations or people can just post them that you approve. Right. And if you've got an employer that you work for, somebody you worked along with, particularly when you have like clients and things like that, that you've helped. Oftentimes, it's a good idea to substantiate that type of stuff. Now, I got to admit, I've never fully used this type thing. I have a couple, have had a couple of people who I helped before in the past uh, go on there and just do that because they were familiar with it. It was one of their ways of saying thank you, right? Um, I could be that is one way in which I could improve my use of LinkedIn making certain people who I've helped with uh, whatever business or legal projects to make certain that once again, they leave me a recommendation. Uh, The next section will be publications. Again, that's more from the academia side. If you're somebody that does a lot of publications, you can publish or you can put those there uh, as a way, as a link to get to them um, or to show what you've done, proof of work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Languages, if I'm assuming if you're more than just English, then you would have this section. I don't think there's, is there really any relevancy if you don't know another language to have? No. And you can, you can pick and choose. There are other sections that you can include in there. Things like interests, uh, you know, uh, hobbies. There's even, you know, you can put things like travel, um, professional organizations, all sorts of things like that, that you can put in there. The the question is, is it relevant to you and is it the stuff that you want to put out there to the world? Yeah. So, well, that's been a really cool just breakdown of LinkedIn in general. If, if, and this is uh, maybe this is just more of a personal question for me, just I'm, I'm truly interested. Is there one part of what we just went through, one part of LinkedIn page, your LinkedIn page that you would consider more important than the other one? Yeah. Uh, once again, I think everything comes down to that about me section. I think that goes a long way. Of course, your job experience, that's going to be first and foremost, very prominent up there, your profile picture, things like that. But where you can really make waves where people don't fully take advantage of it is that about me section. Okay. Cause that is your opportunity to write that cover letter along with the resume. Right. Yeah, I, I kind of see that one as being more, almost more open. Um, mm-hmm. where you're going to have to take more time and, and, and focus on it a little bit more because, you know, your experience is your experience. You're not going to, hopefully you're not going to embellish that. I mean, you're just, you're just saying, this is what I did. Whereas the about me is, you know, you can, it's, it's a wide open canvas and you're really putting yourself out there to, to show the best picture of yourself for, for those who are, you know, using LinkedIn. Yeah. And, you know, which brings us to the next point about, you know, uh, what are you going to use it for, right? Yep. Like, how are you going to? And the number one thing I see with most people is they want to use it to create opportunities for themselves. So they're either using it to find those opportunities or they're using it to get found. Okay. Now, in that prior episode we did, I talked a lot about how you're using it to find other people, right? You can just ser- use the extensive search feature in there and find people who are in organizations uh, network with them, look at their profile, uh, understand things about career paths, what they did to get where they are. It's just a method of communicating, connecting, and, you know, honestly setting up little mini role models for yourself. You might even take the relationship further and establish a relationship, which is more like a mentor relationship where you can talk to these people, ask advice, things like that. So once again, in that aspect, it is a social platform. It is a professional social platform, right? Your ability to reach out. You can also find out when companies are posting jobs. LinkedIn's now becoming quickly the number one platform for all professional organizations, large and small. And for a while now, it's been the number one for large organizations where they post job opportunities in order for candidates, right, uh, to find it and to create interest in the position. Now, normally those postings are sourced to a recruiter. So that's what we call the the passive search 
for employees. They're putting the job description out there. A recruiter, sometimes it's an internal recruiter, but usually it's an external recruiter, manages that job posting. And they're the ones who receive the uh, applications from employees and from potential employees and things like that. And they're culling the herd to get down to a small group that they recommend to the employer, right? And if you get hired, that's how the, um, the external recruiter earns their commission, right? So with that being said, uh, you know, companies are, again, creating that passive level of awareness. So you can search for those opportunities. If you follow companies, right, you can set up alerts for when they make postings, particularly job postings, things like that, right? So you stay top of mind aware of, you know, when they're hiring, what they're looking for, that type of thing, all right? So that's that's number one, right? You are you can actively search out companies, search out open positions, search out people to connect with, search out those things. And that's what a lot of people, that's as far as their understanding of LinkedIn goes, right? They think it's just a place where you post your resume and then you search for job opportunities, right? Well, let me but, ask you this too, because you're just talking about how, how to find things. Mm-hmm. Is there anything you can say about how to get found? Yes. that That is the next step. That okay. is the more proficient user of LinkedIn. So what I just told you about was uh, kind of the model that companies follow now. Small, medium, and big company, when they use LinkedIn t- to find people for positions, they're not just floating this job description out there and reviewing every resume that comes in because they would get tens, sometimes even hundreds of thousands of applications if you're like at a company like Google or Microsoft, yeah. right? Or Facebook or something like that, right? So they don't want to go through all these. So what they do is they outsource it to a recruiter, a recruiter posts these, and there are automatic filtering functions that will, you know, filter you out if you don't meet the requirements and recommendations. So this passive use by recruiters is just as much as anything to create interest. But what the recruiters are primarily doing to find candidates for the position is they're actively searching. They're trying to find candidates who meet the characteristics of the job description, which you remember I told you to go back and, you know, try to incorporate your career path, uh, objectives, goals, learning, uh, you know, skills, all that kind of stuff that is required of certain positions. Incorporate that into your LinkedIn profile. So these recruiters who are searching for people to recommend to the company for interview and things like that, when they search, they come across your profile, right? You're the one that comes up. And there are 500 million people on LinkedIn, right? There are only 320 million people in the United States. So throughout the world, there are a lot of candidates, right? So the question becomes, how are you going to show up higher on a recruiter's search? Now, that it's it's a little bit different than your SEO, which is what you're doing at, for a website, right? Your search engine optimization, mm-hmm. you're trying to come up higher in search. Well, in this case, LinkedIn has their internal search engine for the recruiters. Recruiters pay a lot of money. It's over a thousand bucks a month to use this service, but this is how they make their living, right? Uh, that's why I said that about, you know, in a prior video, I said over 90% of recruiters use exclusively LinkedIn. That's all they use to find candidates. Because it's got such a good search function and there are so many people on LinkedIn. So what you do is after you've done all the keyword optimization, so in your about me, in your talking title, in your job descriptions, all those things, in your skill sets, in your endorsements and recommendations, you stuff with those keywords. That's part one. Next, you need to put yourself in a smaller pool that will show up when that recruiter searches. So they'll get general results when they search, but they also prioritize people that one are connected with them or are closer connections, right? First party, second party, third party connections. And two, they can prioritize it if you have in some way followed or shown an interest in that company. So those are the real two things you have to do to be found. Number one, connect with any recruiter. Connect with all recruiters. Reach out to them. In a way, a recruiter is dealing in you. You are their inventory. They are trying to propose you for positions. So connecting with them, they are going to connect with you, right? They don't have the 10,000 person limit that we, the rest of us do. 
they can have tens of thousands of connections and they will. So what you want to do is make certain after you've done all that keyword optimization throughout your page, connect with recruiters. They are going to be connected with other recruiters, right? You can actually search for recruiters for in particular industries or for particular companies that you want to work for. If you connect with any of these, when they are searching for jobs for these companies, right? When they are searching for candidates for positions posted with these companies, it's going to show up first the people who are most closely connected with them. Just like when you search somebody, it'll show your first party connections first. Mm -hmm. If you're a first party connection, you will show up higher in their search results. So that's number one. Connect with any recruiters you can. And most recruiters are connected with with hundreds of other recruiters, right? Just by virtue of, so at bare minimum, you're going to show up in the second party connection profile, right? So you've already eliminated of those 500 million people. You've gotten yourself down to the the few thousand, right? And recruiters work hard. They're going to look through a thousand, right? Profiles and things like that. They may skim it really quickly, but they will search actively for people who meet those criteria. And that's who they're going to click on first. Also, it's going to subcategorize by people who are particularly interested in positions with these companies or in these industries. So that will help you as well. You should follow companies that you are definitely targeting for to work for, right? You should put as your interest these career field paths and things like that. That will help, again, narrow down and be found when they're searching for these career industry positions. So between those two things, that's number one and number two, okay? Now, what that means is, so you will only show up in their search if you toggle over and say, I am looking for positions. Like if you look at my profile, I do not have that turned on. So I do not show up in recruiter searches, right? But if I did, all of a sudden when recruiters searched and they were searching the keywords on my profile, I would show up, particularly if I were connected to people to whom they are connected, right? And I have about 8,000 connections on, on LinkedIn. So there's a pretty good chance that I would show up in a lot of recruiters searches because of these 8,000 people, most of them are in academia or in the similar field that I am, right? Or I went to business school with them or law school with them. So there would be some level of connection there. So then I would, again, drop myself into the hat of, yes, recruiters can find me when they're searching for these types of keywords uh, type thing. And with that being said, if you're, if you're a short list type person, right? The recruiter has identified you as a potential candidate. They will then reach out to you for a screening interview and say, hey, are you interested in this? Sometimes it's just an email. Other times it's they actually call you up and say, look, there's this position. You may be a good fit. Is this something you'd be interested in type scenario? And that will set the ball rolling for a more formal interview process and how they will work with you to get you prepared for the interview process. Because once again, if you're in their small group who they recommend to the company, that's how you get the interview. So that's it. I mean, that's the core tool of why you're trying to be found. Okay. I mean, some, some people go further and try to use it to sell their own professional services and you can equally do that. And the process is honestly not as mechanical, right? Because there's no set people to connect with. Um, again, it's, then it's more about those recommendations, endorsements, and, and you just actively connected with connecting with people who may be searching for somebody in this, in this skill set or area. That's really interesting. We're coming down to the the end of the episode and I wanted to get one more quick question in just to kind of get your opinion to help maybe the listeners a little bit more. Is there one or two like little tips or tricks that you have for the LinkedIn etiquette? Is there anything that we need to pay attention to? Yeah. Uh, the biggest thing comes in when you're connecting with people. If you're going to connect with somebody, make sure it's relevant. Introduce yourself. Explain why you're connecting or where you've met or what your objectives are, that type of thing. It comes across as honest. So once again, don't just spam a whole bunch of people. Connect with them with purpose. Gotcha. Okay, that type of thing. Um, also, don't send spammy direct messages to people. Nobody wants to be spammed, that type of thing. They will... They will unlink you, right? Uh, Unfollow, if you will. They will unlink you if you do that type thing. And it it can honestly create a bad impression. Um, Not fully uh, doing the, not fully laying out your profile or lying on your profile, saying you have skills you don't have, that's negative, right? That, That is poor etiquette. Don't do that 
type thing because, you know, it will ultimately hurt you in the long run uh, type scenario and, and degrade your reputation out there. Remember, this is a reputation platform, right? You're trying to build up your professional reputation there, uh, that type of thing. So there's that, right? So no lying, right? Liars have to have a great memory. Uh, you're going to get called on it. Uh, no spammy stuff, right? Connect with people uh, with purpose. Uh, don't get into, don't talk about uh, the off-limit topics on LinkedIn, which usually that's anything, you know, religion, sex, or politics, right? Avoid those topics. This is a professional platform. You talk about professional topics, career stuff, industry stuff, accomplishments, things like that. Focus on those things, right? Uh, not the opinion-based stuff about what's going on in the news or whatnot. I also uh, read a, a report uh, a little while ago. Don't use it as a dating app. Oh, yes. Uh, definitely <laughs> do not. And, you know, this is this is a problem. Uh, I, I've read about this as well, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, people create their profile and people are reaching out to them with uh, unwanted s- solicitations right yeah. trying to people trying to ask them out or doing it whether it's a whether it's an appropriate yeah. <laughs> invitation or otherwise but basically trying to hit on people yeah. on linkedin is that's not what it's for right uh, type thing you there are other apps for that <laughs> no and so a lot well, of them apparently this has been a, a great episode this has been a very again for me somebody who doesn't Hasn't spent a lot of time on LinkedIn that hasn't focused much of their time. And I'm, I'm, I'm working on it, especially after the last episode too. Uh, I'm still, still learning it. So this has been a great episode for me, uh, hopefully for the listeners as well. Uh, do you have anything to say before we head out? Just remind everybody, visit us on any of our platforms where you can communicate with us. Tell us those things you want to hear about, because that's why we're here. We want to talk about the things that matter to you. So, well, awesome. Well, Until next time, we hope you have a good one. We hope we see you there. Goodbye. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Reschooled Podcast. Be sure to head over to reschooled.com for news and other information on things we're getting into.